Miru I team. I will be hosting the current session and I extend a very warm welcome to each one of you who have been connected with us through our iDubs webinar. Also, I would like to thank you all for taking the time out from your heavy schedule and marking our program with your glorious presence. Thank you for joining with us this evening. And also, don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel so you can always be in touch with our programs even in the future. For now, I would like to step forward to inaugurate today's session. And also, I would like to notify you all that we will be having our discussion session at the end of the webinar. So if you get any queries in between the session, then just drop them on our comment section. We will get back to you later on. Today, we have again with us a very special guest, Dr. Mark Tov, all the way from USA. And he will be continuing his previous topic, that is vision therapy, a foundation on which to build. Before he begins, I would again like to give his general introduction. Dr. Mark is an OD, MS, a fellow of American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of COVD. Also, he is a fellow distinguished practitioner in the National Academics of Practice. I welcome you, Dr. Mark, on the behalf of Medway Foundation and all our participants. Thank you so much. Uh, let me get my screen sharing here. And let me get the slideshow going. Slideshow, current slide. So hopefully everybody can see that. Okay, let me just look at my timing. Yeah. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. All right. So I'm going to pick off, pick up where I left off. Uh, we had just started talking about some different activities. Uh, and I, uh, I have videos for many of these. Um, for some of them, I'm just going to have to kind of demonstrate a little bit. Um, and hopefully uh, you can, you can see me. If not, I'll, I'll try to Use, uh, you, use your skills of visualization, which are very important in vision therapy. Uh, so let's, let's test those out uh, on the ones that I don't have videos for. So we were talking about some of the first activities that I like to do in vision therapy. And we talked a little bit, i go backwards for one, about the wolf wands and doing an activity called eye control. All about where the, pay, the, the person's eyes are pointing and what does it feel like for their eyes to be in certain directions and the recognition that the eyes are uh, just one part of the body and they can move separately uh, and together or, or together with the head, which can move separately or together with the body, uh, the torso, which can move separately or together with the, the lower uh, part of the body, the legs, the feet. Um, so the next activity is called CP saccades or central peripheral saccades. Uh, the activity is aimed at the expansion of the volume of space. So imagine uh, you have a, a broomstick without the, the broom end on it, and you're kind of holding it like a sword with two hands. And um, in front of you, you have a central target uh, this could be, uh, um, usually you're looking at a wall, uh, so it could be a, a, a sticker on a wall, it could be on a, a chalkboard or a whiteboard, so it really could be anything. And all around, um, peripherally, are other targets. Um, the aim is to, while the patient is looking at the central target, um, they use their peripheral vision, that hence the central peripheral, to move the broom slowly to hit one of the other targets. It's very important that they don't look over to see where they're going. They wanna, or we're really aiming to get to use their, uh, their peripherally, uh, their peripheral vision to uh, see where they are aiming. The beautiful thing about this is that um, one of the, the, the challenges, you, you find that there are a few mistakes that people make. 
The first being is A, they'll cheat and they'll look. The second is that they'll go way too quickly. So my goal is to try to slow them down. And I generally try to get them to do about five seconds from the center target, moving that broom out really slowly to one of the peripheral targets. Um, if they have trouble doing that in five seconds, they keep going too fast. You could always uh, have them count. You could always make it harder and, and have them do use a metronome. So, you know, beat, 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 beat. And by the time they hit that fifth beat, then they're out at that target. As with any good vision therapy activity, there has to be feedback. Well, what's the feedback here? If the broomstick or the mop, whatever, um, is not pointed at the target they were looking at, uh, where they were aiming for, then that's immediate feedback that there's some mismatch between their central system and their peripheral system. The other thing is the targets can be totally changed. You can use um, letters, you can do numbers, um, you could really do anything. You can also alter the size of the targets that you're aiming for. Certainly the smaller the target, the more difficult, but also the more peripheral, the more difficult. Also a really good activity for patients who have um, a field loss uh, due to either a field cut or neglect. Um, the trick is you don't want to be as peripheral in the side of the loss. So this is a really neat activity. And, you know, as I said, you know, last week, you don't have to have expensive equipment all the time to get, you know, good results. And this is literally a stick and a wall and some stickers. Heart charts are, again, another one of those activities that are so inexpensive. Um, these really, you don't have to, these don't have to be anything special. You can make them up on, on a Word document. Uh, they don't have to be a specific size. Um, you know, certainly the, the, um, the near chart, the smaller those letters are, the more challenging it is going to be. Um, heart charts can be used for, with, with numbers and letters and symbols if you have a child that is too young. Uh, for letters or numbers. We've got ones with dogs and birds and cats and, and you know, those kinds of things. Um, so heart charts can be used for accommodation. They can be used for eye movements in terms of saccades, but also for visual attention. Um, I, I don't remember if I have it, but there's an activity called flashlight uh, pointing, which has um, the patient using flashlights, moving them peripherally and calling off the letters on the uh, distance chart. So that's really looking at visual attention and eye movements as well. So the activity that I like uh, with heart charts is called uh, near-far heart chart. And there are three levels for near-far heart chart. For this activity, the patient is, um, the chart, the distance chart is about 10 feet away. So the first level simply has the patient holding up the near chart, the small chart that you see there, it's kind of the yellow one, holding that chart out at arm's length. You can do this both monocularly, but then later on you do this binocularly. You can even do this activity with monocular, uh, with a, a binocularly with an anti-suppression in place. Say you had the letters were both in green and red and black. Now, all of a sudden, you have anti-suppression if you're using red-green glasses. You can also do it in theory using uh, red-green glasses uh, and bar readers or polarized lenses and bar readers. So the first component of near-far heart chart is the chart at arm's length. They can read a full line at distance and a full line at near, you know, so forth. They can read half a line at distance and near. The next activity is to do this with the chart, the near chart, slowly coming up as they're reading. Then they read a distance and then 
the chart is brought out back to arm's length. And as they're reading, they're slowly bringing it back up again. The third, uh, and, and certainly the hardest, of course, is you start off with the chart literally as close as you can possibly make it, and it just starts to get blurry. And then you pull it out just a hair, and that near chart stays at about, you know, two, three inches from the, from the, the nose. And they're reading distance and near and distance and near. Um, so it's a really, really challenging activity. How could you make this one harder? Geez, you could probably make this one harder by putting them on a walking rail. Uh, you could probably make this one harder by putting them on a balance board, uh, a trampoline, anything that's gonna mess with their vestibular system. Um, it would be interesting. Uh, uh, you know, so there's so many different ways. Column jumping. Column jumping is a little bit different and this just has a distance chart. So you're standing a little bit closer and um, um, the trick is, you know, we'll go back to the chart for a second. So you see the chart and you have the chart that says, you know, P-L-T-N-D-H-C-O. So instead of reading them horizontally, we're gonna do them vertically for column jumping. So for column jumping, say you did lines that start with P and O. P, uh, P O, uh, uh, H, N, T, H. How could you make that harder? What if we went to the inner columns? Now there's a lot more noise in trying to find that column. So we do say T, H, C, L. So I'm doing the third and the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm doing three and six. What if I made it even harder? What if I did three columns? What if I did P, T, H, H, C, L? So I'm now doing one, three, five. I can make it even harder than that. What if I did one, three, seven? So now there's different jumps between the columns. You can make it even harder. You can put it with a metronome. So you can see that you're just trying to find ways to make it harder, but you could also make it easier. How could you make this easier? If the patient gets lost, you can make the print larger. You can bring them closer, but then also you can lose some of the columns. So I have charts with only four columns on them. So any combination that you need to work with your patient. So this is wall saccades. So we don't use all of these. These are, uh, we traditionally only use four of them. And the wall saccades are, uh, they can be as separated as you want. They can be, you know, five feet away from each other, you know, one, two, three, four, um, one on, uh, uh, just in a box. Uh, they can also be um, mismatched where you have uh, uh, two on top and one um, different distances on the bottom. Uh, so there's different distances between the jumps. Uh, you could even start to use uh, and have one be a little bit more um, um, diagonal than the other. You really can, can, can do so much with, with wall saccades. So ball games, this is probably one of my most favorite activities. The kids and the patients love it. There's so much you can do with a Marsden ball. So with ball games, we're trying to develop the ability, I'm sorry, develop the ability to track a moving object in space. So in these ball games, we're trying to actually hit the ball, but in other games, uh, later on, uh, say you're, you're using a walking rail, you're trying to avoid hitting the ball. So again, just like we started with eye control, we're trying to provide an opportunity for the patient to use their eyes free and free from the rest of their body. So I know I have a video on this. Let me see if I can get it to go. So there are three different levels with the basic ball games. The first one is um, uh, kind of call it punch ball. And you can, uh, you'll see in the first video that I'm literally patting the ball back and forth. This is one of my residents. 
and I'm patting the ball back and forth. First, I'm using my palm because it's larger. Then next, I'm going to use my fists like I'm boxing. And then the third, I'm going to just use a, a finger. So I'm decreasing the amount of surface area from palm, fist, finger. Let me show you this video. So you can see it's pretty much coming straight ahead. He's using his palms. And now we're gonna to go to fists. Now we're doing thumbs or fingers. And I'm just, I'm mimicking, I'm the one who's got the camera and I am mimicking that back to him. The next level is called the ball catch or three catch. So you're doing something similar, you'll see in the video, uh, but you're catching it, the same concept, using your palms, then your fists, and then your fingertips. Really, again, we're just decreasing the amount of surface area for you to perform the same task. So he's got his arms out like an angel. And as it comes closer, he is trying to judge it and catch it with his palms. The trick is he cannot bend his arms because we want him to be able to judge the space at the distance of his arms. And these are claws. So he's using his fingers to kind of trap the ball. As you can see, it took him a few times. And the third activity is called look and catch. So this is a little bit more complicated, but you'll see that it builds on the previous activity. So there are gonna be three options. You've got the palms, the fist, and the fingertips, or the claws. So I'm gonna release the ball, and you'll see that on that ball, this is something that we made up. Uh, you can get all of the pieces on Amazon. It's just a simple pinky ball. Uh, and we use a kind of a crochet needle to poke a hole and bring the string through and we tie it, out, tie it around. Um, and it works really well. It's, it's very inexpensive and very easy to do. So we put the, num the letters and numbers on there. So we're gonna, sw gonna swing it first and then it's gonna come back. On the first swing, he picks out the letter or the number that is facing him as it comes closer. So he's really got to concentrate. The ball swings back. I call out palm, fist, or fingertips. And he's got to do that on the second time. All while remembering what that letter was that uh, he was seeing as it was coming closer. So you can see that it takes a lot of concentration and it really has got to build those skills. Now, in theory, you could make this harder. You could put them on a trampoline. You can put them on a, a balance, uh, a square balance board. So now he's got to balance himself uh, at the same time as doing all of these activities. Um, you could always make it harder. That, that's, that's the fun part about VT. Ah, speaking of the balance board. So here's our balance board. Let me, let me move my, I don't know if my head is in the way here, so let me move it over. So the balance board, you'll, you'll kind of probably hear the same concepts over and over again. And, and it makes sense because these are the bases for my VT. So with eye control and with um, the ball games, we're teaching how to move our eyes free and separate from the body. This activity does the same thing, but we're doing this with now the lower portion of the body. So if you imagine the body is three triangles, the head is one, 
the legs to the waist is another, and then your torso in the middle is the third. So this is uh, really aiming at um, uh, working on those eye movements. So you can see in the lower uh, left here, you've got balance boards with different square with different squares, different uh, bottoms. So some are smaller, some are larger. Certainly the larger they are, the hard, the easier it's gonna be. The smaller squares, and I've even seen some with rounded edges, are really hard. It takes a lot of balance. So um, let me show you, I actually have a video here of uh, another past resident doing this activity. Oh, hold on, wrong video. There we go. So you'll see, look at his upper body. And yes, it shifts a little bit, but it's not moving for the most part. His eyes are nice and stable. His head is stable. His torso is stable. All that's moving is the lower portion of his body. And look at the difference. This is poor performance. Obviously, he's, he's kind of making that up. So um, you know, the key is, uh, I, I even had this the other day with a, an older patient um, who was having trouble. So what I did was I gave her feedback. I put her in front of a mirror so that as she was doing it, she could see what her body was doing. Um, so it was giving her that visual feedback uh, for, the, for the, um, the tactile input. Now, this is actually another student of mine. I didn't, didn't plan this. I just happened to walk in to the VT room and this is what she was doing. So yes, her body's moving a little bit, but she's doing ball bunting with bean bags on the, on the balance board. And I just saw that and I started taping immediately. This is like athlete level skills. It is so insanely impressive. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And she, I'm just, I, I've got a, she's in VT with me now and, and she's, she's tremendous. Oops, let me. So the next activity is the rotator. The rotator can be used for so many different things. Um, you can, there's really no right or wrong way to use the rotator. Uh, so again, the key again is, is uh, this is kind of a mixture of central peripheral targets. This is eye movements. This is visual attention. Uh, this is eyes moving, uh, uh, hand eye coordination. Uh, so the rotator is such a great activity. Um, there are, uh, this is a standing rotator, but there are tabletop rotators. So now you're coming in from the top versus coming in straight uh, ahead. Um, the speed of the rotator can be controlled. So um, one of the things that student patients have trouble with very early on is they might be able to do the central targets really well because they don't rotate very much, but the peripheral targets might be more challenging. Um, a good rotator is going to have good controls and you just may need to slow that down a little bit. So there are several different ways. Uh, you can also see that there is an anti-suppression component to it as well, because these targets are, uh, there are red green on these targets. So using um, um, uh, red green glasses, uh, you may say, I want you to put the peg on the, uh, on the outline of the red square. Well, if the patient is suppressing that eye, they're not gonna appreciate that red square. So several different ways you can do that. I think I have my video here. So here you can see that we've got a peg, golf tee, and he's following it around for several times. Generally do it three times.
So here, instead of just doing a straight in, he's following it. This is working pursuit eye movements. This is working central peripheral awareness, but this is also working visual attention. And now we're gonna grab a different way to do this. This is using a, um, a pipe cleaner. And this is really working visual attention. So the key is to um, keep the peg or the T in the middle of the loop for three circles. And then you kind of hang it on there. Now he's gonna hang it on there. Come on, Zach. There we go. So you could really alter the demand by changing the, the parameters, going more peripheral, uh, speeding up the rotator, um, even using the alternate hand, um, the non-dominant hand can be a very challenging for the patient as well. So lenses and prism, let's see. No videos for a little while. So lenses and prism. So these are the absolute most important part of vision therapy. There are so many different ways to use lenses and prisms. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you a few of them. So for mental minus, what we're using is we're using a lens blank, uh, just an uncut lens. And we're trying to get an understanding that the patient and not the lens is controlling accommodation. That the patient is in charge of what's happening and what they, uh, if they're appreciating blur, if they're appreciating clarity, if they're appreciating uh, even getting further silo or soli. So the trick is we start with a, a very high minus lens and uh, this is a mental minus, so it's, it's a, a monocular skill. So we drop in this lens and can the patient clear that lens? Do they have enough control and understanding of their accommodative system to um, make that happen? But it's also, um, the, the trick is to clear the lens, but then once that lens is taken out, can they keep that blur in place? So it's keep it clear, now, can they blur their uh, blur to the same, can they blur? So can they clear it? And then can they blur it? And it's also about perception and space. So it's, you know, do they see with that minus lens that things are getting smaller? Are there size differences? So you're trying to lay the groundwork for uh, some of the language of smaller and in and closer that you're gonna be using later on. Accommodative rock. Accommodative rock is, is kind of the, the staple of, of VT. Uh, this is with a lens flipper. Uh, and the beautiful thing about the lens powers is um, uh, you have your trial lenses uh, in your lens kit. And you can also, instead of buying pre-made flippers, uh, I prefer pre-made flippers. Uh, I generally do in, um, 50 steps. So the flipper is going to have plus minus 50 plus minus one, uh, all the way up to two fifties. And I'll tell you why I don't go higher than that. But you can also use your uh, lens wells um, and build a flipper there if you don't want to purchase one. The reason I actually go up to two uh, fifties, uh, some of the textbook will say, you know, you want to go um, uh, plus 250 all the way to minus six. And that's, you know, an eight and a half diopter accommodative difference. And I just don't think that's necessary. Uh, this is a five diopter difference and that's plenty. 
Um, so I've, I've made a conscious effort not to go up higher than that. And uh, this can be done binocularly with the use of a suppression check. And that's either a polarized bar reader or a red green bar reader with the appropriate glasses. And you can do this over uh, any reading material. So we have books, um, uh, the patient can bring a magazine, whatever they want. And uh, as they're flipping, you can do it uh, every 10 seconds. You can do it uh, the end of every sentence, every three or four words. The more frequent the flips, the more challenging the activity. The neat thing about this is that you can also give those lens slippers out to use for home activities. So prism opposite. Let me talk just a little bit about prism facility first. So prism facility is very similar to accommodative facility in that, um, but of, of course you're using the opposite system as the dominant system. You know, with the binocular flippers, you're still, you're not only working binocular accommodation, you are working your binocular vision. You're working convergence and divergence as you flip from plus to minus. The same is true on prism facility. Your the the skill set that is the primary skill set that we're working on is vergence. But obviously, if we want the patient to see clear single binocular vision, the clear is the accommodative system. Uh, so the prism facility, uh, you can use whatever uh, prism you want. Uh, the testing for prism facility is uh, 12 base out, uh, three base in. But if you typically are using uh, two, three, four, maybe even five, might be a little bit high. Um, so if you go to one, two, three, um, and you're just doing small jumps, um, that's a good uh, test of somebody's ability. As I said, it's not about the, the amount they can jump, but within those small differences in PRISM, can they control the system? I'd rather have really good control in a more narrow uh, band of PRISM or f uh, lenses than really cruddy control in a larger band of PRISM. Uh, of, of, of differences. So for prism opposites, so prism opposites is used, uh, again, very, very similar in, in other activities, an understanding of where the eye is and where it's moving in its specific directions. This is one of the basic skill sets for strabismics. If the patient has an esotrope, how could you ever get them to be straight if they don't understand what it feels like for their eye to be straight? So uh, for the esotrope, you're gonna use base in and you're gonna send their eye or push their eye all the way out. So they have an understanding and a feeling of what their eye is when it's doing that. For uh, exotropes, base out sends them in. Again, just a feeling of what it, what, what their eye is supposed to be doing. The power depends on the degree of the turn. Obviously you need a higher prism with a 30 uh, diopter ESO than a 10 diopter ESO. And what they're doing with these activities is they're really, um, um, you can, I mean, honestly, you could have them do anything. You can have them look at targets. It could be dynamic. Um, you could even have them do some of the activities that we've just been talking about. Uh, the prism rotator would be, would be a, a good activity to do. Uh, in theory, you could have them do saccadic activities with prism opposites uh, with a heart chart. Um, so many different things you could be doing. For rotator glasses, rotator glasses are great. I think I have, oh, I don't have that video. Um, the rotator glasses are really great um, they come in powers ranging from anywhere from two to 45. And the direction can be rotated. You can have uh, dissociating prism. Uh, for some activities we want to dissociate, but for most uh, we are going in the same direction. That's you know, known as yoked prism. And we use these for patients with special needs, for patients with traumatic brain injury, um, depending on whatever the diagnosis is, is going to depend on the power of the lenses that we try, but also the direction that they're going. 
the MFBF matching game, uh, this is kind of a, a middle ground. Uh, this is kind of an anti-suppression. Uh, uh, and the MFBF stands for monocular fixation in a binocular field. So this is going to be an activity that is going to be between monocular and binocular skills. You'll see here, let's see, do I have a closer picture? No. So um, the neat thing about this is that, you know, as we know, if one eye accommodates, the other accommodates. If, um, if one eye does a virgin's movement in, the other eye is going to follow suit. That's just basic rules of, of anatomy and physiology. So what this is taking off is you can see on the um, picture on the left, you've got two targets. You've got um, black writing on, uh, it's a clear acetate, but then you put a red filter on top. And then you have the white tiles with the red writing. The um, uh, red tiles are seen by the eye with the green filter over them. And the black writing is seen by the lens with the red filter in front of it. So as we're going back and forth between the tiles and the where we're trying to put them on the acetate, each eye is taking turns. The neat thing with that is that you can make it even harder by the addition of plus and minus lenses. So say I put plus in one eye and minus in front of the other eye. It's never plus in front of both eyes or minus in front of both eyes because we want that kind of bimming and bopping, focusing, not focusing, stimulation, relaxation as we're going back and forth. So I generally will start on the lower side, plus minus 50s, but then I'm building up all the way up to the plus minus 250s again. And this can be over several different weeks. You know, I think mean, that's the one thing that we have to keep an eye on is we don't want to move too quickly. You, as I said to one of my residents yesterday, this patient is, we had a 25 year old student. This patient has obviously been successful enough, but now they're in need of our help. And it took 15 years of studying and being a type A personality. So they're not gonna break down as easily as we want. We have to take the time to do it right. Let's see, We've got about seven minutes left. So this is a, a good few minutes. So my favorite activity is the Brock string. Um, Fred Brock was as an optometrist uh, back in the 19, uh, uh, 40s, 50s, and, and 60s, and really 70s. Um, and just, uh, he was on just a different plane. Um, I've read some of his writings and it's just, it's, it's crazy, amazing stuff. Um, and we're actually uh, through OEP right now, we're working on a manuscript uh, of his uh, stuff that was published back in the 40s and 50s uh, that we're putting back together and redoing images and fixing things up. Um, uh, and that'll hopefully be out next year sometime. Um, the Brock string is, is so simple, um, it's so stinking simple. Um, essentially, you've got three different color beads. Uh, you've got the red, yellow, and green. I've seen uh, Brock strings with five beads. Um, I've seen Brock strings with uh, the beads being uh, a basketball, a soccer ball, a tennis ball, uh, really, is, and there's no reason, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, so the first concept with Bronx string is the concept of physiologic diplopia. So uh, I know we're, we're missing part of the string in our picture. So when you look at the yellow bead, you know, the, the, the concept that the beads in front of it, the green and then the red, if there were two, uh, um, that you're seeing those, you're seeing two strings going in, two strings going out of the bead. And regardless of which bead you look at, you are still seeing double on the other beads. So it's building an understanding of depth perception and what normal and abnormal binocular vision looks like. So now the other thing we can tell with Brock string is suppression. So say the string only appears to be coming from the, uh, 
um, right eye. If the string only becomes appearing from the right eye, then where's that left eye? That left eye is suppressing. To break the suppression, you need to change the viewing uh, standpoint. Uh, the thing that I like to do is I like to pluck the string. So I'll slowly kind of just tap on the string a little bit, kind of wake it up. Um, we try blinking. Uh, we've even tried putting on red-green glasses. You could also use something called a uh, TBIT, uh, which essentially is um, uh, two little flashing lights uh, that you hold in front of the eye for five minutes. Anything to try to break that suppression. There are several different ways you can use the Brock string. Uh, I start with just fixed bead jumps, uh, kind of going right from physiological diplopia to these. Um, the trick is you don't want to start off, say you have a convergence insufficient, you don't want to start off with that bead being right towards the front. You want to start with it very far away. And uh, not very far, but you also want other beads further so that you, when you're doing those jumps, you're keeping the physiologic diplopia in mind, but you're giving them an understanding of what it feels like for their eyes to be starting to converge. If you put that bead up real up close to begin with, they're never gonna be able to keep and sustain that fixation. The neat thing about this is also that you can do this in different head positions. Um, so say in theory, you have an athlete that is a, say it's a, a, a cricket player and they go into their batting stance and now all of a sudden they're in their batting stance and they're looking up, now they see double. Well, the trick is uh, you wanna work in the gaze that they can do it well, but then eventually move towards the gaze that they have trouble in. The next step is um, bead sliding. Um, so what I do is I will slowly start to bring that bead closer, all the while asking for feedback. The next activity is called bug on a string. So you've got three different beads at different distances, and they're imagining a small bug crawling on that string as it gets closer and further away. And it's that fine coordination, that fine vergence movements that are very challenging. Uh, let me end with these. So here you've got so many different ways to hit fusion. Uh, probably the most well-known is the picture in the middle. Those are called the lifesaver cards. The lifesaver cards are special. Uh, th these all have the same concept is that you want to try to find and make a third circle in the middle. Um, what's neat about the lifesaver cards is there's an accommodative stimulus. Um, what's neat about those is that um, each, if, if you're fused and you've got the picture in the middle, the, in the letters clear and then underneath it, certain letters pop out at you. You'll see that these are red green, but also the sports one from Burnell is also got a red green focus to it as well. And when those come together, you've got the red and the green, they're gonna kind of make like an orangey color. So that's another feedback mechanism that they're seeing that circle in the middle. The, um, um, pennies up top, um, uh, the, the, an activity called C3 coins, you fuse. But then the neat thing about that with any of these is that you can move in a circular pattern, you can move up and back. Um, so uh, there's a dynamic component to it. Uh, the eccentric circles, those are the two targets up on to the top right. Um, those can be in both, really any of these, uh, except the panties of course, can be either uh, opaque or they can be transparent. If they are clear, if they're transparent, then you're generally working divergence. If they're uh, on white paper, as you can see the Burnell card is, then you're gonna be working convergence. Um, uh, so, you know, again, these are not expensive things. Obviously the, the pennies, 
uh, use whatever coins are, uh, you can use. It doesn't really matter. They have to be the same coins. Um, but again, these are things that the patient can make at home to support what you're doing. Um, uh, and there, there, there are just so many different ways to, to work the visual system without spending a ton of money. Uh, and you'll see so far, I've given you probably 10 or 15 activities and the output for money is virtually nothing. Um, of course, the next one I would talk about would be vectorgrams. Those are gonna cost money. Um, but for now, let's, uh, let's kind of end here. I think that takes up my 45 minutes. Uh, so I just wanna leave some time for some questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Mark, for such a wonderful session. Now we are to move to our next session that is discussion session. Are you ready to take the questions, doctor? Yes. Yeah. Our first question is, what is the normal range of prism facility and accommodative facility? I'm sorry, I missed, I missed the question. Okay. What is the normal range of prism facility and accommodative facility? The question is also there in the chat screen of Zoom. You can also have a look over there. So the normal range of, so I start off with accommodative facility with plus minus 50. Um, and I generally will build to um, uh, in steps of 50, uh, up to 250s, plus minus 250s. Facility range, um, uh, I don't generally go higher than uh, uh, three uh, base in and 12 base out. Um, uh, I generally will, will keep it within about three and three. Again, I'd rather have really good control with um, uh, the smaller ranges than try to build up to you know, this huge range and have, have fragile control. So that's, that's generally where I stand. Okay, hope that answers the questions. Now, these are the only the questions that have been seen on our chat screen. We'll be waiting for just a few minutes if anyone is willing to ask. Okay, I have a one quiz, doctor. So, so you do the, uh, am I audible to you, doctor? What's that? Uh, am I audible to you? I, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, whenever we do the, we do the broadcasting test and uh, we generally uh, refer to the one meter due to the uh, bed size or we, regularly practicing the one meter distance with including the five beads in like uh, 10 or 15 centimeters. And uh, we do the different type of like jumping or moving the uh, beads from one kernel to the near to the nose. So what would you refer like more than one meter distance or six meter distance, or it will be okay if we do it the one meter. For, for which activity? Uh, broadcasting. So where would I start? Um, it really depends on the patient. You know, obviously, if the patient has a uh, a convergence insufficiency, I mean, I'm going to start it further. Um, um, probably, uh, uh, probably a few feet away, two three feet away. Um, if the person is a convergence excess. Um, um, you know, you may need to uh, start it a little bit closer, uh, start, it, start it closer and then move it back further. Um, it, it all kind of depends on the patient. You know, uh, there, there isn't necessarily a set distance that, that I use. I'll, I'll use, you know, whatever, whatever I have, whatever I can, you know, whatever the patient is, I'll work with them. 
Okay, so uh, really, bit size don't ma does matter while doing the these block strings. The, the size, you know. Um, uh, I mean, most of the block strings that I work with are pretty similar in size. Uh, you know, certainly the smaller the bead, the harder the activity. Um, that's for sure. Um, so you know, I, you know, most of the beads that I have are pretty standard. Um, so I, I have not necessarily, you know, used beads with smaller or larger. All right. But that's that is one way to alter it. Okay. So thank you so much for your answer, Doctor. I see the next question on the chat box. Let me check out. All right. Uh, Daman Alis are asking for how we can perform the accommodative facility in rock chart or other charts. Is the question in the chat? Yeah, just let me drop you on a comment section. Okay. Uh... Is nutritional amblyopia reversible? Uh, I I need a definition of what this person, what, what is nutritional, what are they, it's just, what are they defining as nutritional amblyopia? Okay. So that might be the deficiency of like vitamin A or anything, doctor? I'm sorry? Uh, might be the deficiency of vitamin A or... Uh, I mean, it, 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 I mean, I'll be honest. I have never, I've never worked with a patient who's had nutritional amblyopia. Um, um, uh, so I, so I, I really can't answer, um, um, too much about it. Um, right. I, I don't know whether the replacement of the missing nutrients will, uh, will improve acuity. I, I just, I mean, I, I don't know. I've I've never I've never worked with that patient population. Okay, doctor. I guess there is a, another question on the top, just before this question, so you can see in the chat box. How do we perform a combinated facility in rock chart or other charts? Um. You really, there's there's no set way or no to do it. Um, you know, a combinated facility. You can you can do it with reading material. You can do it with. Uh, letters, you can do it with numbers. Um, every, say it was in a chart um, at near, you can have them flip every two letters, um, every or, or every word, um, flip back and forth. Um, the only trick is when you're doing binocular flipping, you have to use that suppression check, the bar reader, uh, either polarized or red green with the appropriate glasses. Okay, thank you for your answers, doctor. These are the only questions that have been raised by our attendees so far. I guess we have answered almost all the questions and considering the time limits, here I announce the closure of discussion session. I would again like to express my immense gratitude towards Dr. Mark for his time and to all the attendees for their endurance. Also, I would like to thank all the direct and indirect helping hands for the ITEX program. Before I pop, I request our today's presenter, Dr. Mark, to share his few words to our program. I just wanted to thank you again for, for bringing me uh, um, virtually to Nepal. Uh, um, and, and I applaud your efforts to, to, to learn more. And, and of course, I'm, I'm always here and, and willing to help. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, um, and my email address is mtaub at sco.edu. I'm always here to help. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's our immense pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, speak to everybody. Here with I announce the closure of today's webinar, hoping to see you all again tomorrow. Stay safe, stay connected. Thank you. Thank you all.
Thank you, doctor. Have a good day.